All right, welcome Neil Vanderstoop to our Story Share Legacy Project. We're so delighted to have you with us here to answer some questions in our new iteration of a Story Share Legacy video. So the first question I'd like to ask you is, what is your full name and were you named after anyone? My full name is Neil Gerald Vanderstoop, but in the native language where I come from, which is Holland, my full name is there, Cornelis Gerardus van der Stoop. And that has been translated in Neil Gerald van der Stoop. All right, and were you, were you named after anybody in particular? Oh yeah, I was named after my uh, dad. Customary in that time was that the eldest son would be called after his father's grandfather on, the, on his father's side. The second one would be called after grandfather on his mother's side. And the third one would be named after the father. In this case, it was my dad. So therefore, I got the same name, name as he had. Very cool. So can you tell us where you were born? I was born in the Netherlands, more popular Holland, in the city of Haarlem in 1930 on December the 28th. All right. What was your favorite part of growing up in Haarlem? My favorite thing in the city of Haarlem was that we were living on the outskirts. There was lots of green space, lots of cows, lots of water. And for us kids, that was an unbelievable playground that was never, never boring. So although, what did you, sorry, go ahead. Although a lot of the parents were not as excited as we were because very often we came home soaking wet from playing in ditches and missing the other side of the ditch and ended up in the water. But for us, it was great. Awesome. And what did you want to be when you grew up? It was, it was not uh, thought about uh, or, or talked about when we were young, what we would like to be or what we, uh, uh, you know, should be, because parents mostly were interested in working possibilities, because in the time that I was growing up, they had a big unemployment situation all over Europe. So when I grew up, my parents did not even think about what uh, their children should become or would do. It was a matter of, oh, that company needs a guy. Yeah, you are going there. And since I was uh, young and the third one, it was something that <laughs> fell by the wayside. It was a matter of survival as a family and trying to do whatever was needed to survive. And those are actually my memories of that time. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, it was, a, it was a hard time too, of course, to be growing up because it was during World War II, right? That you that you spent a good portion of your childhood. Mm -hmm. yeah. But also before the war, actually, you know, looking back, uh, for a lot of people in the country I grew up in, it was an exciting situation that there was war because war meant work. Um, and they really could not care and probably did not care what the consequences were uh, eventually, but 
the first thing that I remember is that I was told, well, you know, it's not so nice to be occupied by a country, but they, they, they are giving us a lot of work possibilities and that's the first thing that a family need to survive. Hmm. Wow, that's fascinating. So, and you had quite, you had quite a large family too, right? It how was. Many, how many uh, siblings did you have? I had eight siblings, hmm. two sisters and six brothers. Wow, so that's a lot of mouths to feed. But it was in that time again, you know, uh, there was a lot of control from uh, big uh, uh, governments and uh, especially a lot of religious influence in governing the country so that, you know, uh, my parents were members of the Roman Catholic Church and that church, you know, uh, encourage you know <laughs> parents to have a lot of children because that meant power the more the better sure sure because they were they were future little parishioners <laughs> yeah that is so true did you did you have a pet growing up did you have any pets oh yes and also that became part of the survival system. I was number three and one day my dad came home in the side pockets of his bicycle with a little uh, two little goats that he had bought and that were eventually you know meant to become food for the family. So I was the one who had to go before school and after school to look after my pets. And I had to find fields where the grass was abundant. And it was a great situation to see how those little animals that I could carry in my hand became very, very heavy and big. And sometimes when they were not in such a good mood to uh, be brought home or to the field, uh, created some problems for 12, 13 year old guys with regards to power. And they were powerful, I tell you. <laughs> wow, so those, those animals, so the pets ended up keeping you alive then during the war, did they? Yes, they did. Yeah. And also when the war, uh, you know, became serious, my dad who, I can not uh, thank much, too much for surviving his whole family because he did everything to keep us alive. And in that time, it was absolutely fantastic how people, you know, did survive. And so therefore, after the, the two girls ended up in the frying pan, my dad came home with two little pigs. And those were, again, the little things that were uh, given to me to look after. So, you know, they start to create a kind of a friendship because, you know, it's always the same person that comes and feeds and, you know, cleans everything. So nobody could enter the little shed where they were growing up in, but me, <laughs> because anybody else that came in, you know, was welcomed with an, uh, a serenade of screaming. And I tell you, pigs are able to scream. And that was a danger so that we had to be careful that the neighbors living in a row, row housing system would not hear that my dad, uh, had those little uh, pigs in the in the shed because it was prohibited by the by the German and the uh, collaborated uh, Dutch government. Anyways, they grew up they grew up to full 
uh, maturity, and they also ended up in the frying pan. But it has to be said that if my dad hadn't done that, his big family that was continuously growing would have been in serious, serious trouble. Wow. Well, that, that's impressive. That's, uh, that's, that's really taking care of your family, isn't it? When, especially such a big family, it's, that was a big challenge when there was really no food around. Indeed, because, you know, there was not that social structure yet that they have now. It was growing, but in that time, it was a matter of survival of the strongest. And if you were, were not strong enough, you know, you fell by the wayside because government did do very little. So it was almost, you know, and, uh, a given that if you wanted to have a family to survive, you had to do whatever you could. And many of those big families were not able to, to keep themselves alive or trying to stay alive and suffered very, very, very much. Churches tried to help them, but you know, the first thing that people need is food. And that was my dad's, you know, his, his slogan. I don't care what's happening, but I have to fill stomachs and I will do that. So. Good for him. Good for him. Yeah, that's that's amazing. You know, that 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 history is so important uh, for everybody to hear. And it's it's so, so neat to hear that from from your own from your own lips, that ex those experiences that you had as a youngster during that time. But I just want to end with one uh, last question. And and I just want to ask you, what would your you've told us lots of interesting facts about yourself. What is a fun fact? that your family would say about you, if they were talking about you, if it was your grandchildren or your children, what would they say is a fun fact about you? Well, again, very important is that we were living as a very dysfunctional family. There were not too many stories told. There were not too many stories shared, but what they heard from my mother is that I was the easiest baby she had from all the nine that she pushed into the world. And the reason that it was so easy for her that in the morning, she put me on the, she put me on the potty and I was sitting there for three, four hours, you know, with some little thing uh, that I could play with. And uh, I had a special uh, little tool that uh, somebody made for me that I could turn and then I wasn't sitting there and constantly saying, turning, turning, turning. And in the Dutch language, is it die, die, die. And my mom always told that story. If there was a problem, you all should be like your brother, Neil, because, and then the story started, the potty, potty story. But it's, it definitely sounds like you were your mother's favorite. I, I really was, but also my, my dad's favorite because oh. I was the in-between guy. When there was a problem with the two brothers older than me, then my mom always said, you know, can you talk to them? Can you ask them? Because, you know, like I said, as uh, a family that uh, existed of 11 persons in one room uh, who had absolutely no connection with each other, which caused a lot, a lot of uh, dysfunction. Um, it was very difficult to accept for me because as you can understand, if I had to go and represented my mom to my brothers, you know, it was not very welcome. If mom said to me, could you ask your brother that he will pay the boarding money, because that was customary too. As soon as you started to work, you had to pay uh, some money, you know, to get the family going. And if I asked him, then you can imagine what, the hands, what his answer was to me. 
the younger ones, you know, were very easy for my mother to say, okay, Neil, take the kids, bring them to bed, and then uh, that's done. So I went upstairs with my youngest brothers, uh, and I was maybe 10, 11, yeah, 12 years old, that I had to bring them to bed. And I didn't want to scream or, or you know, suppress. I told them uh, stories. And they were always geared to heaven, angels, be good. <laughs> because that's just what we were uh, grown up with, you know, you better be good. Being, being the favorite definitely came with a price, didn't it? It came with a price. Anyway, I just want to thank you so much for sharing those stories today. And obviously you're still a very good storyteller just the way you were for your younger brothers and sisters. So thank you for sharing your answers with me today. And, uh, and thank you for participating in our legacy project. Okay, I thank you for the opportunity that I could share some of what happened to me. And I am very, very interested and curious how this will work out in the future. And I wish you lots of success.